Dick, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for many reasons, and with an extra history. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful series. Uh, I do want to begin by saying I'm representing uh, close to 3,000 people, as, uh, as Dick mentioned. Uh, what I'll be sharing with you in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is the result of uh, the coalition of uh, many, many people from more than 80 countries, and it's a privilege to speak on their behalf. I want to take special note of the role of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in the program. A little at the end to talk about the management of the program, but the Sloan Foundation provided the, the, the platform, the, uh, the core funding for the program over more than a decade. And uh, so I want to make a special appreciation. It's uh, not easy to get continuity uh, for programs like this. Uh, I also want to thank the scientific community in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Washington, D.C., in fact, is the most important places in the world uh, for ocean science. Uh, and I want to take special note of uh, a couple of the elders who tutored me and helped me to learn how to do something like this. Uh, Dr. Frank Press, who's here this evening, uh, past president of the National Academy of Sciences. I watched him develop the international decade of natural disaster reduction and other programs. And also, I believe uh, Mrs. White is here this evening, uh, Mrs. Robert M. White. And uh, uh, Bob was the, uh, the creator of the Global Earth Research Program and the World Climate Program and uh, other uh, tremendous, uh, complex uh, scientific programs. Uh, from which uh, the census uh, took many lessons. Uh, uh, I won't read all the names here, but uh, you can see that in the Washington area, uh, there were people from the federal agencies, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Office of Naval Research, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, from the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, from the National Geographic Society, the Smithsonian. And perhaps m some of you are, are in the audience uh, and others from the area who contributed to the program, and I want to thank you. I know Jim Baker is here. Jim was the uh, administrator of NOAA when the first glimmer of the program uh, came around, and we went to see Jim and said, well, what do you think about this? And he said, well, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy, but you should try. And uh, we did, and then Jim, uh, uh, played a major role, actually, in carrying out the program. But what was it? As Dick mentioned, it was a decade-long program, uh, officially beginning in 2000, going until 2010, to look at uh, diversity, all the forms of life in the ocean, distribution, where they live, their addresses, and abundance, uh, how many of each kind, how many individuals or how many kilos. And we were interested in everything that lived in the ocean. And this was one of the different things about the census. All previous studies of marine life had uh, limited themselves to uh, a few thousand forms of ocean life. And we ended up looking at about 250,000. Uh, so it wasn't only what was in the, the fish stores or in an aquarium. We looked from the very small, the microbes, to the largest animals on Earth, the uh, marine mammals, the whales. And we looked in all ocean realms from the, the, uh, the poles to the equators, from the deep sea to the sea surface. Uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council Ocean Studies Board uh, study that helping the census get going uh, at its outset said, well, we should organize around uh, four great questions. What did live in the oceans? Uh, for which we developed a program on the history of marine animal populations, what does live in the oceans, what's there today, for which uh, we developed many field projects to go out and look, and then uh, a program to look at what will live in the oceans, the future, for which one needs to, to uh, develop uh, numerical models to forecast. And then finally, there's the question of how to access and visualize all the information. Uh, now this seems routine with the internet, but in the late 90s, uh, the question of how to how to uh, visualize was uh, much more wide open. Uh, first, let me give you some reminders about the oceans themselves, the vast, uh, varied environments. Uh, here you see uh, a map of, of Earth, uh, the way uh, oceanographers see it. Uh, the, uh, the land areas are featureless and dull, uh, and the oceans have all the interest. Uh, and you can see there are these uh, 
dark blue abyssal plains, uh, the, uh, the largest habitat on Earth, averaging about 12,000 feet deep. There are huge mountain ranges like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here, the largest mountain range on Earth uh, rising from the sea floor uh, like the Andes or the Rockies and sometimes uh, uh, piercing uh, the sea surface as in the Azores Islands. Uh, then the, the shelves, the shallow shelves, which may be uh, uh, 200, 300 feet deep uh, the, the, uh, in the salmon pink. Uh, from the, the shelves, you have the continental margins that slope down to the, uh, into the abyssal plains. Of course, in the shallow areas, you have reefs. So we wanted to look at all these different environments, and again, from the poles to the, the tropical regions uh, uh, in all the oceans. Well, why now? And uh, Dick uh, 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 shared some of the motivation in his opening remarks. Uh, on the one hand, the ocean is more crowded uh, than ever. Uh, there are more uses and more users. Uh, there, there's uh, fishing, uh, there are uh, offshore oil and gas, windmills. People want to put uh, energy m machines out there to capture uh, tidal waves, uh, ca ca excuse me, capture the energy from the tides. So uh, the industrialization of the oceans is a motivation, uh, the, the many changes that are taking place. Uh, here you see a, a map of the surface of the world oceans for the year 2009 with all the ship tracks uh, of large vessels recorded. Uh, there are about 100,000 large vessels now uh, in the oceans altogether, more than about 300 gross tons, about three times the number that there were uh, in 1960. And so you can see many oceans are being crisscrossed on the surface all the time uh, by, by the vessels. Uh, the sea floor is crowded too. Here you see uh, sea floor cables, telecommunications cables. Those of you with your Blackberries, or not Blackberries anymore, your, 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 I, your iPhone 5s, uh, uh, you, you, may, you may be communicating through satellites, but more likely you're communicating uh, through seafloor cables if you're communicating long distances or getting information. And so you see all the cables laid across the Atlantic or across the Pacific down to Australia and scalloping along the, the coasts. It's easier to lay a, a telecommunications cable on the seafloor off of the coast of Brazil than to burrow through the jungle. Uh, and all these, these are optical fiber cables all laid in the last 25 years. Uh, this may look like the, uh, a map of the railroads in, the, in uh, New York or Pennsylvania in 1850 or in England, but it's not. It's the seafloor south of New Orleans. Here's, this is New Orleans, Louisiana, and here's Houston. Um, and uh, these are uh, oil and gas pipelines uh, that uh, uh, transport oil and gas uh, extracted from the seafloor uh, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, onto uh, to the coast. And the, the North Sea and the South China Sea and other areas uh, are the same. So both the sea surface and the sea floor are being industrialized and lots of activity. So it seemed a very good idea to have a baseline uh, now of all life in the oceans with all these changes taking place. Now, how, how would one go about that? Well, if you're in the near shore and interested in what's living in shallow water and rocky shores and tidal pools, uh, like uh, 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 Robin Rigby here, you can uh, take these, uh, these metal frames, these quadrats, and uh, uh, in some, uh, and with snorkeling or with some simple scuba gear, you can go to shallow water and lay these over different uh, areas of the sea floor and uh, uh, count what's uh, in each uh, square, photograph it, in some cases take samples. Um, uh, so there's a particular culture for the near shore work if you're, if you're trying to work in the Antarctic, and this is uh, 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 Patrick Halpin and some members of our Antarctic team, uh, of course the conditions are quite different. Uh, it's much harder, much more expensive, much more dangerous. Uh, and uh, this is in the good Antarctic season. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, polar researchers have quite a different style. Uh, and of course you need lots of different technologies finally. Uh, here's an example from the Arctic. Uh, this is an expedition that I had the privilege of participating in and we used uh, these, uh, these submersibles with, uh, with cameras and lights and, and uh, jars that could uh, suck up some of the creatures that we could see with the cameras. And this could go down 10,000 feet to the sea floor in the Arctic Ocean and we had under ice scuba divers uh, we had uh, devices that could land on the seafloor. 
Uh, we had nets that could be lowered to different depths to uh, collect uh, jellies, uh, and we had people with little vials collecting uh, little, little bottles of water, uh, ampules of water with microbes in them. So on our expeditions, we had all kinds of people working uh, shallow and deep, working on large animals and small. Uh, uh, finally, it became a concerto of technologies. Uh, so there were people working on the ice as just now. There were people flying in airplanes uh, using uh, uh, a kind of laser ranging LIDARs to look into the, the uh, the near surface of the ocean, we had scuba divers, we had manned submersibles, we had unmanned submersibles, we had uh, fish with cell phones reporting back to us, uh, 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 animal allies. Uh, so uh, uh, it, the, the, the only way to do it finally was through this whole, integrating this whole range of technologies. So there were 14 different field projects, uh, 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 polar reefs, uh, large animals, plankton, and so forth. Well, let me give a preview of the results. Uh, this is a wonderful cartoon by the, the cartoonist Jim Toomey, uh, Sherman's Lagoon. Some of you may read his, his cartoon. And he took an interest in the census and ran several series uh, that the Washington Post, among others, uh, published. And here you can see the, the uh, sea life itself. Uh, this, this fish is looking at the shark. And it's, uh, here you can see his uh, the little board says census of marine life. and. Uh, manta ray and so forth, white tip shark, uh, and he's counting. And the, the, uh, 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 well, the, uh, uh, so the, the well, <laughs> uh, there was, uh, I'll come back to this. There's some, of course, there is some humor in the whole program, too. Uh, the, so we looked, as I mentioned at the outset, at diversity, the kinds of life, and as Dick mentioned, the, 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 the headline is uh, the oceans are even richer in diversity than anybody had known or been able to to show. Uh, distribution, the oceans are more connected than uh, had ever been appreciated in more ways, and in terms of abundance, uh, more altered. Now, let me now go into the main part of the talk, and I'll talk first about diversity, some of what we learned about diversity, then I'll talk some about what we learned about distribution, and then some about abundance. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, the largest mountain range on Earth, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, running here between South America and Africa and between uh, North America and Europe. Uh, we had uh, big expeditions uh, led by a, Nor a Norwegian team from Bergen uh, that uh, did wonderful work in the, both in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic. Uh, now, of course, this area between uh, uh, New England and England and France and so forth, uh, this has been traversed by vessels uh, regularly for 500 years, and you might think that everything has been discovered, uh, but far from it. Uh, there were many new species discovered uh, uh, on the Atlantic Ridge and the North Atlantic, including this magnificent uh, octopus, uh, uh, the, and this is one of the 1,200 new species that, uh, that Dick mentioned that the, uh, the census uh, discovered. So you know, even, even though uh, uh, lots of ocean liners and freighters and, and oceanographic research vessels have crossed back and forth, they're, they're, the, uh, the, lotion, the oceans are still, there's still an enormous amount uh, to discover. Uh, I'll come back to this theme about how much is still unknown. Uh, another octopus. This is an octopus that uh, that uh, came and registered with us, that came and visited with us. Uh, Nancy Knowlton, of, uh, who's uh, the lead scientist, ocean scientist at the Smithsonian Institution here in Washington, uh, and her colleagues developed a wonderful, simple new technology for looking at uh, what lives on reefs, basically empty dollhouses. And imagine uh, putting an empty dollhouse on each of uh, a couple of hundred different reefs around the world, and you leave the dollhouse there for a year, and then you collect it, and you see what's moved in. Uh, it's a completely non-destructive way of sampling the reef. You don't have to drill into the reef. You don't have to try to pull things out, let the, the animals come and move in. And this uh, marvelous octopus moved into uh, one of the, uh, the census dollhouses on the Great Barrier Reef, and that was a, it's a new species that had uh, never been described before. Uh, plankton, there are lots of uh, th small things that float around uh, in, the, in the oceans. Uh, uh, 
uh, there was a very strong uh, team looking at, uh, at uh, uh, about 12,000 different kinds of plankton that, uh, 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 that are known to live in the oceans and discovering more new ones. Uh, and this was one that was found in uh, uh, near uh, uh, between the Philippines and Indonesia and in the Celebes Sea uh, in the uh, Western Pacific, uh, uh, nicknamed the, the squid worm. Uh, just amazing, uh, beautiful uh, animals. Uh, the Angola Basin off uh, southern Africa, uh, 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 there was a German-led expedition there uh, on the seafloor, on the abyssal plains there. Uh, and uh, they found 800 different uh, uh, copepods, uh, or sort of uh, bugs, bug-like creatures, uh, living uh, on the sediment and in the sediment. Uh, and then our Southern Ocean team uh, found more than 700 uh, isopods, of which 500, we believe, are new to science. They haven't all been described yet. Here you see five examples of the copepods and isopods, and uh, uh, you know they're, I think they're as good as uh, the jewelers on Fifth Avenue in New York, the imagination, uh, it's uh, hard to uh, compete with uh, nature's imagination. Um, of course, we also found new fish. Uh, the title of my talk is Every Fish in the Sea. Uh, we made an estimate of the, the number of known uh, uh, fish in the sea at the time of the release of our statement. It was 16,784 different kinds of known true fishes, true marine fishes. And the, uh, the ichthyologists in the project estimated that there are still between four and 5,000 more uh, fish yet to be discovered. So those of you uh, who want to name a fish for someone in your family, you still may have an opportunity. Uh, this was a, a new reef fish discovered by Rich Pyle from the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, and uh, Dick mentioned the Encyclopedia of Life. When we, as soon as we would discover a new species, we would, uh, it's like Facebook, we would give it a page uh, with images and uh, gene sequences and other kinds of information. And in fact, this online Encyclopedia of Life now has uh, web pages for more than 130,000 of uh, the marine species. So about half of the known marine species now have, uh, have, uh, have uh, pages. The, now, uh, the species, it's not just that we discovered astounding species, but they're, uh, and the astounding richness, but they, uh, we discovered a lot of biologically very interesting species and kinds of species. Uh, for example, uh, the, the carnivorous sponges. Uh, you wouldn't want to be a shrimp swimming by one of these sponges. Uh, it's like kind of like a Venus flytrap plant in the Amazon. Uh, the, these were the first known uh, 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 carnivorous sponges, uh, and it turns out there are actually quite a few of them in the, in the deep sea. Uh, so the, uh, there are many ways of making a living. Uh, also, longevity. Uh, we're accustomed to the idea that some forms of marine life, like turtles uh, uh, or whales, may live uh, 100 to, to, to some of their some whales live longer than 200 years. But uh, imagine a sea worm that was born before Christopher Columbus. Uh, this is a type of sea worm that leaves a creates a kind of shell around itself, and you can use the, uh, the chemical composition of the shell to estimate the age of the, the worm. And uh, these worms, found by a team led by uh, Chris German from uh, uh, Woods Hole, uh, Eva Ramirez from Barcelona, uh, 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 explored uh, one of the deep canyons, uh, uh, 6,000 feet deep in the Gulf of Mexico, and they found these uh, these uh, worms that uh, are more than 500 years old. So uh, uh, the, uh, these are, uh, uh, there may be some interesting things we can learn from, uh, for, for human uh, medicine and so forth from uh, some of these very long-lived creatures. Another very interesting discovery, uh, science fiction authors and people interested in the origins of life had been speculating for some time that there should be anaerobic animals, animals that would uh, live without oxygen. And uh, 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 Roberto da Novaro, uh, uh, a census researcher from Italy, from the University of Ancona in Italy, on an expedition uh, looking at the seafloor in the uh, eastern Mediterranean, not too far from the island of Crete, uh, for the first time found uh, this uh, 
species of uh, the uh, uh, Lorisiferin. Uh, his wife's name is Chintzia. He named it for his wife, uh, Nanoloricus Chintzia. And uh, these are probably survivors from an ancient anoxic ecological niche from, from uh, uh, hundreds of millions of years ago uh, before the oceans were filled with, with more oxygen. We found new habitats also, not just new species, and in places where, again, where you think, well, maybe everything is already known. Uh, the Gulf of Cadiz uh, in Spain, here's Gibraltar, here's the Gulf of Cadiz, and this again is where Christopher Columbus uh, and many others set sail for the New World, and you'd think uh, here in uh, an area like that, people would know what lived there. But it turns out uh, that uh, uh, mud volcanoes, uh, very interesting uh, 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 habitat uh, on the seafloor, there are now quite a few of them have been discovered. Uh, and there are particular kinds of life, of course, that uh, live uh, in association with these mud volcanoes. Uh, and like some other uh, uh, animals that live in the so-called vents, the deep sea vents, uh, they, they don't depend on sunlight. They don't depend on uh, uh, photosynthesis. Uh, there's a whole distinctive uh, 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 fauna. And uh, uh, this one, uh, people thought it had uh, uh, looked a little bit like a Rastafarian, so it was named uh, the Bob Marley worm. <laughs> uh, 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 at the end of the, the decade, uh, we made a fresh estimate of the total species, uh, uh, known species in the ocean for the first time. Uh, I was actually uh, surprised when we started the program in the late 90s that there wasn't some book or some list there uh, already of all the forms of life in the ocean, but there wasn't. And uh, our best estimate is that there are about 250,000 known named species already, and there is now a website which has about 220,000 of those that are uh, in an orderly list, very accessible. And uh, we also estimated uh, how many remain to be discovered, and we think 90% of the forms of life in the ocean remain to be discovered and described. Uh, there may be two million more species, uh, most of them very small, of course, but uh, uh, there's just an enormous amount. Uh, now, why uh, would there be so much still to discover? Rare animals, uh, the long tail, something I'll come back to, things that are small, and of course the oceans are just very hard to sample. They're immense. They have 3D complexity. There are habitats that are very hard to reach. And also, actually, there are very few experts for many of the groups. So worms, if, you know, there, there may be quite a few people who study fish, the ichthyologists, but there aren't so many people who study the, the nematodes or some of the other forms of life. So there's a, there is just a lot to be learned about some of the lesser known taxa, the lesser known groups. Well, we aggregated what we knew in 25 different regions to try to get a general picture of uh, uh, what a typical region might look like. For example, the Mid-Atlantic here. Uh, if you went to the, the coast in, in Virginia or Delaware or North Carolina, and uh, the, the, that, an area like this might have, let's say, 10,000 known species. Uh, and if you go to the fish store, of course, you're used to the idea that there'll be, there'll be fish, but if you divide up uh, by different groups, by different, uh, the, the uh, 10,000 typical known species, you find, in fact, that the most abundant of the known species are crustaceans, the crabs, lobsters, shrimp, barnacles, uh, at 19%. Next would come the mollusks at 17%, uh, the clams, uh, the squid, the octopus. The fish would be third. Uh, some of the small protists would be fourth, the, some of the algae and the plant-like organisms would be fifth, the worms sixth, jellyfish uh, seventh, and so on. So uh, the, uh, we, we try to give people a, you know, a broader sense of what the totality of, of marine life uh, is, and it, it, it's certainly more than is, than is the fi in the fish store. Uh, in turn, that information can be useful in thinking about uh, uh, parks or protected areas, national parks uh, or marine protected areas for the ocean. Uh, we made maps for a lot of different regions in which we charted the, the, the diversity or the, the richness in terms of biodiversity of different areas. So here you see the Caribbean, this is Cuba, uh, uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, Panama and so forth. And the, the, the uh, 
the darkness of the red square means the, the richness of the diversity of that region. And you can see there are some areas like the coast of Colombia or the coast of Belize or the coast of Cuba, uh, uh, east of Puerto Rico, which have a, a sp special richness. And of course, if you're interested, as many of us are in marine conservation, then uh, this provides an objective and rational basis for designating areas as parks. You want these hot spots to be the areas that receive the, the, the most careful uh, protection. Uh, in fact, we also made maps for the entire world using the entire database of the census to uh, estimate uh, the, uh, the, 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 the richness of biodiversity uh, for all taxa, for coastal taxa, and for the, the, the uh, oceanic taxa, the things like the tuna and so forth that go out uh, in the, the deep blue. And what comes across very strongly, of course, is this incredible richness of the region from Japan uh, down through Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, down to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, this area sometimes called the Coral Triangle. So uh, uh, people intuitively had known this, but it had not been possible, uh, the, there hadn't been, uh, the, the databases hadn't existed to make uh, really objective descriptions uh, of, uh, of the diversity. Let me turn to distribution now, uh, where things live. Uh, and uh, here's the uh, a viper fish, named for Sloan, uh, also. The, the, uh, uh, and here are places that it's been recorded to live. So you can see here's a fish that lives in, in, uh, in many places. Uh, there, it probably lives in lots more places. These are just the observations we have. And one of the very important things the census did, as I mentioned at the outset, was create a uh, a, a spatial database where everybody who makes reliable observations of a species could enter that information. So all the different people who study the viper fish or all the different people who study a barnacle or uh, a jelly could all enter it into a shared uh, database showing locations. Now some, some uh, uh, marine animals, uh, uh, did I skip one? Yeah, some marine animals, uh, are sessile, they stay in one place, they sit in one place, and others move. Uh, but in any case, you'd like to know what lives in a given region, and uh, it, it can be useful. Uh, one example is the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, shortly before the Deepwater Horizon accident in April of 2010, fortunately, our Gulf of Mexico team, uh, led by Wes Tennell from uh, uh, Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi, Texas, had completed the first comprehensive baseline list of all the species in the Gulf of Mexico, 15,419 that they'd identified. They'd put this into a, a database. Uh, here's a map of the Gulf of Mexico. Here's Louisiana. Here's where the Deepwater Horizon spill occurred. Here's Florida, Mexico, Cuba. And you can see there are eight pie slices here, and in the north-northeast pie slice of the Gulf of Mexico where the spill occurred, uh, Wes and his colleagues uh, had recorded the presence of 8,332 different species. And you can imagine this list was downloaded a lot after the accident occurred and uh, was Im extremely important. You can't do before and after studies unless you have a baseline. Now, Tuna, uh, there are tuna that live in the Gulf of Mexico that swim all the way past the coast here and go all the way up to, uh, to Canada. Uh, you don't want to, you need to know uh, uh, the movements of animals uh, if you want to do a census. You don't want to count the same one twice. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, and lots of species, uh, in fact, uh, migrate long distances. Uh, we follow, the census followed uh, more than 40 species on long distance migrations. Uh, I'll show you just uh, uh, a few examples. This is a leatherback turtle. Leatherback turtles uh, uh, got their cell phones uh, uh, on a beach in, in uh, uh, Costa Rica, and they swam out past the Galapagos Islands. Here you see South America. Peru would be over here, and Chile down here. And uh, they, th their cell phones also took the temperature of the water when they would dive. Uh, and uh, the, the animals, of course, uh, dive to, to uh, eat and forage, and we're able to uh, develop a picture of the, uh, the physical attributes of the ocean as well, very valuable. Here's another example, elephant seals, big seals. Here's Antarctica, the South Pole would be there. This is the Antarctic Peninsula that goes up towards South America. 
and there's a shallow shelf here. The yellow is the continent, the land mass, the land and ice. And here you can see the elephant seals swam from what's called a seamount, one seamount to another. So the seamounts were, were like, uh, like uh, rest stops or uh, 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 McDonald's along uh, in the ocean. And so you can see that the, the, uh, uh, a lot of the animals use these, uh, the uh, uh, topological, uh, uh, geographical attributes of the, uh, of the open ocean. Uh, sea life itself will aggregate around these features, so there's more to eat. And then you can see that they, uh, uh, they dive also down to the tops of the seamounts. And in some cases, uh, the deepest dive that we had in the census was 2,300 meters. That's almost 7,000 feet. Uh, if you think of how you feel when you try to dive uh, without scuba gear just uh, uh, 10 or 12 feet down, imagine the physiology of an animal that can dive uh, uh, five or six times as deep as the Empire State Building. And these were another type, type of seal, crab eater seals, that uh, like to live uh, on, the, on the shelf. These are the elephant seals again. Here's Antarctica, South America, Australia. And you see they, they, Antarctica is their habitat. They circumnavigate uh, the, uh, the entire continent. So the, the world looks very different to the, uh, to if you're an elephant seal uh, from uh, uh, a human, obviously, or a barnacle. Uh, and there are just uh, these endless ways of connecting the oceans. Uh, things can connect by drifting, but they can, can, can connect by actively swimming as well as the elephant seals do. Uh, we also looked at animals along the shore, along the coastline. So we used something like Easy Pass. We, the, a team based in Vancouver set up toll booths along the west coast of uh, North America and British Columbia and Alaska. Uh, and again, we gave the animals uh, sort of cell phones. And let me just show you a very short uh, animation. Um, uh, some of you have probably been to the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we uh, tagged some of the animals in the Rocky Mountains in the Snake River here. They got the red and blue means they have tags. And they're swimming out of the Columbia River. Uh, this is past Portland, and they're being these are, these are young salmon, uh, about the size of a frankfurter. Uh, and a lot of them are being eaten here by, by seabirds and uh, seals and so forth. But some of them will swim all the way past Vancouver Island. And here they'll appear to portage over this island, but they actually swim around it. And Alaska is up here. Uh, and the, uh, you know, so if you've gone whitewater rafting on the Snake River in the Rocky Mountains, it's hard to believe. But here the days are going by. Let me just show it one more time. In the course of about 60 days, an animal the size of a frankfurter swims 1,500 miles from Idaho to Alaska. Uh, and these kinds of migrations uh, had never been followed in detail uh, until the, the, the census helped advance the technology. And this sort of thing is now in much more widespread use. And by having these the sort of toll booths along the shore, one could uh, 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 follow them. And it's very important because you want to know where animals die in the oceans as well, not just from fishing, but from other causes. Uh, go back to uh, the main presentation. So here you see uh, the, the size of the, the salmon being tagged. Again, it's the size of a hot dog or a banana, and it will be able to swim 1,500 miles. Now, we saw pictures of tuna early, uh, bluefin tuna. And uh, this is the tale of one tuna that we uh, first gave a cell phone to off Southern California over here in the dark blue dots. It was January, February. And then come the green dots, March, April. In the course of two months, the salmon swam most of the way to Japan. Then in the course of May and June, the yellow dots, it went all the way to Tokyo. Uh, it saw that what the Japanese do to tuna. It turned around, <laughs> and in the red dots, in the course of the next 60 days, it swam to Mexico. Uh, the, uh, this one particular tuna swam 25,000 nautical miles in 600 days. In both the Atlantic and the Pacific, there's been debate about whether there are separate populations that live here and live here. But the, the census was able to show that uh, a tuna may be in Sicily or in near Spain, uh, 
uh, one month, and uh, three months later it could be in the Gulf of Mexico or off Florida. So uh, the, uh, the animals connect the ocean in incredible ways. And finally they form, they, they're these kind of these highways, these white dots are the bluefin tuna going back and forth commuting like uh, jet set businessmen between Los Angeles and Tokyo. Uh, the, uh, the yellow dots are, these are uh, uh, white sharks that go back and forth between San Francisco and Hawaii, I'll come back to that. Uh, these are turtles. So they're, they're uh, what we came to call blue highways, and they're neighborhoods. So, you know, if you're flying over the Atlantic or the Pacific, you look down, it just looks dark blue or black. But actually, if you look underneath, you know, it's like the DC metro. There's all this stuff going on underneath, all this, all this, all this movement. Um, and I'll now show you uh, another short animation, um, the same thing. With the, this is the North Pacific, and it shows a lot of different species. Uh, time is going by, and the, the colors here represent the, the heat of the water, the, the sea surface temperature. So red or orange means warm water, blue means cold water. And so it's getting colder up here, and some these are salmon sharks that are leaving the, uh, the Gulf of Alaska and Prince William Sound. And here you see in the, the yellow, these are the, the, the tuna, again, leave, that go from California this way. And uh, the, uh, uh, there are uh, elephant seals that go from California up to the Aleutian Islands. So the, uh, uh, there are all these patterns going on. This is work that was led by Barbara Block from Stanford University and Dan Costa from University of California at Santa Cruz. Uh, there's similar work has been done in several other oceans now. And so as the seasons are going by, as the water temperature is changing, all this stuff is going on, all these seasonal migrations, uh, different kinds of animals connecting the oceans in, in different ways. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, it's not a featureless, uh, it only looks featureless to us. Uh, the, one of the remarkable examples of uh, migration is uh, the white shark. Uh, this is the west coast of California. You can sort of see San Francisco Bay, the little bit of blue up there. and. Uh, uh, Monterey would be down here. This is the peninsula that goes up to the city of San Francisco. On December 15th of 2005, uh, one of the members of the census tagged a white shark over here. And uh, this is the track of the white shark. It swam all the way to Hawaii and hung around mostly the big island, uh, eating pineapples or doing whatever, surfing. Uh, and then uh, it swam back, and you can see uh, a little less than a year later, on October 11, 2006, it shed its tag just a few hundred yards from where it was tagged. So, you know, we're a little bit used to the idea that birds migrate or that salmon migrate, but uh, think about uh, swimming yourself from, think about just trying to find Hawaii from San Francisco if you jumped in the water. Get it, then if you got to Hawaii, imagine swimming back to exactly the same spot. Uh, so there's all this vertical motion in the ocean, but there's horizontal motion too. And the world's largest migration is not uh, uh, the traffic in Washington, D.C. every morning. Uh, it's actually uh, from uh, about uh, 1,200 feet, 400 meters down in the ocean to the surface each day. Here you see the height of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, this was a day in June in 2004 in the North Atlantic, and all this kind of yellow-green stuff is sea life, uh, fish and jellies and plankton and different kinds of things. And this is, uh, it's noon, 1,200 hours, then about 9 o'clock at night, 21.30, it gets dark, and all of a sudden, all these animals go up to the surface where it's now dark and they feel safer and they can feed. And then at 4.48 in the morning, you know, the sun is starting to rise, and down they go. Uh, so, but you know, if you imagine a shrimp climbing the Eiffel Tower in the course of about an hour, uh, and then descending again the next morning, uh, so there's just incredible uh, movement and connectivity. Uh, now, let me sp speak about abundance. Having spoken about diversity and distribution, uh, here you see a family with some large groupers that they caught off Key West. So this is work done by our history team that collected lots of postcards and photos to try to understand changes. And here's a photograph of the Greyhound, the same recreational fishing boat in 2007 in Key West. And you can see 
quite a contrast between the catch. And the story in terms of abundance, unfortunately, uh, is uh, not a happy one. It goes way back, though. It's not just uh, modern times. Here, the, the Romans were incredibly effective fishermen. Tuna was actually the favorite food of, of the Romans. Uh, and uh, the Romans are believed to extract it about 100,000 tons a year of sea life from the Mediterranean um, and using very sophisticated uh, nets and hooks and techniques. Swordfish uh, harpooned off uh, North America, off this, this area and a bit north, off New Jersey, off uh, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, Nova Scotia. Uh, you can see the average swordfish uh, harpooned in 1860. Uh, it was about uh, uh, 500 pounds. And then by 1880, it was smaller, and by uh, 1930, it was less than 200 pounds. Uh, so the, uh, the large animals, uh, the, the, uh, it's not just in the last few years. The techniques for hunting uh, were very efficient earlier. Now, you might think this is the Tokyo fish market, the Japanese the Tsukuji, which is famous for, for, for the tuna. But in fact, this is uh, a bluefin tuna fish market in Denmark in 1946. There were, uh, there were big, big populations of bluefin tuna in the North Atlantic uh, uh, until the early 1950s. Uh, there used to be a sport fishing tournament to catch the biggest tuna between Sweden and Denmark, uh, between Copenhagen. There's now a bridge that goes from Copenhagen over to, uh, to Sweden. Uh, and uh, people used to catch uh, tuna like this. It's 19, this is 1946, uh, the cover of a Swedish sport fishing magazine. And now, needless to say, you're lucky to catch a herring in that area. But as Dick said at the beginning, there, are, there is still a lot. Uh, and uh, the, uh, here in the Gulf of Maine, here's Cape Cod, uh, uh, Boston, uh, using a new technique, a new acoustic technique, a kind of acoustic lighthouse, uh, uh, we, we uh, found huge uh, schools of herring, uh, which Americans don't eat that much now, and it's one of the reasons the populations are strong, uh, and one of the largest aggregations of animals ever seen, a quarter of a billion fish, 250 million t herring uh, uh, were seen in a, in a shoal about the size of Manhattan Island. Uh, we uh, then went and we did net a few of them to make sure it wasn't just uh, computers telling us that. Uh, the, our, our team's doing uh, integrative work then looked at lots of different studies uh, of different kinds. For example, tw 14 studies of reef fish and 41 studies of sharks to try to estimate the fraction that had been lost since uh, fishing became important, say 500 years ago. And in many of the groups, 90% uh, uh, of, we believe that 90% of the large animals have been lost. In some of the groups, like the, the seals, the pinnipeds, and the whales, this lighter gray bar indicates recovery. So in the areas where there's protection, like some of the ground fish, some of the seabirds, some of the whales, and the seals, the good news is that uh, uh, there has been, there has been uh, there, uh, recovery. Extinction is rare in the oceans. Uh, it's hard to get that last animal. It's, the oceans are so big. So if we leave things alone, uh, uh, things can grow back. Uh, direct removal of animals, fishing, uh, is uh, the biggest cause of the uh, decline of populations. Uh, but there are other causes, too, uh, habitat destruction. Uh, but a very tragic one is uh, the marine debris. On one of the expeditions in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, a uh, great photographer, Susan Middleton, photographed this albatross and everything in the belly of the albatross. Uh, the, uh, as those of you who have cats, you know that cats sometimes swallow things and then they'll regurgitate them. Uh, and albatross are the same, and some of the other seabirds, they'll swallow uh, things that, that are not digestible, uh, shells, whatever, and regurgitate them. But when you swallow cigarette lighters and so forth, and a lot of bottle caps, uh, uh, it's hard to survive. And this is one albatross. Uh, I've spoken mainly about the larger forms of sea life, but there's a hidden majority, the marine microbes, the small stuff, and in fact, by weight, uh, the marine microbes probably make up 90% of everything in the ocean. If you sieve the ocean, most 90% of what you'd have would be the very small, form, very small forms of life. And when you take a gulp of seawater, you may have 20,000 phyllotypes or 20,000 different kinds of, uh, 
of the very small life. Uh, and of course, these are, in many cases, ubiqu ubiquitous and also connect the oceans uh, in the same way, in a, well, in a way, in an important way, uh, and ju just as large animals do. And these small things can aggregate into big things. Uh, one of the wonderful discoveries of the census was a, a mat, a bacterial mat the size of Greece off Chile, uh, one of the largest uh, known living objects ever seen. Uh, and uh, it, it's a filamentous mat like a carpet made out of a bacteria called uh, Biaploca. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest discoveries of the census was uh, in the, uh, the very small stuff, the uh, 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 the microbes, uh, the, the Census of Marine Microbes team led by Mitch Sogan from the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole uh, published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the most cited papers of the census on microbial diversity in the deep sea and the underexplored rare biosphere. This long tail, there are a few things like that thiaploca that are high abundance, but then there are out there in nature, there are just this, there's this enormous reservoir of possibility of different ways of, of being, and if the circumstances, uh, the context were to change, maybe things that were out here and rare would move up here. With climate change or other changes, uh, it's very important to understand some of these low abundance populations better. And this paper in a few years has already garnered more than a thousand citations and become a citation classic. Uh, finally, we estimate that there are 10 to the 28th microbes in the ocean, just uh, numbers that are, you know, kind of, I mean, how can you even decide between 10 to the 27th and 10 to the 29th? It's crazy. Um, but uh, the, when you look at the oceans, uh, you should look at the oceans the way you look at the stars in the sky, the, uh, in terms of the, the microbes, the very small life. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a galaxy. Uh, uh, of, uh, of microbes along with the, the tuna and the turtles and the big forms, the big forms of life. I've spoken about what we learned, mostly about the, uh, the explored, the, 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 uh, uh, what we know, uh, but I, I've also mentioned sometimes what remains to be discovered or what's unexplored. Here's a, a map looking down on the North Pole. Uh, here's Greenland, here's Canada, Alaska, Russia, uh, Scandinavia, Iceland. The red means we have a lot of records in the, in the marine life database of the census. Uh, and you can see that around England, Ireland, lots of measures. Uh, around New England, lots of measures. Uh, around uh, the northwest of the United States, lots of, lots of observations and measures. But the dark blue means very few, and white means essentially none. So. The, uh, there are still many, many unexplored parts of the oceans for life. We may have looked at the, we may have, we may have a geological map, but it means we haven't had systematic biological exploration. And you can see there's just a tremendous bias towards areas that are uh, near the rich countries, near major, ma major marine labs, and so forth. Uh, here are two maps of the Eastern Pacific. Here's Australia and South America over here. Again, Australia and South America. These are big squares where uh, five degree squares, and this, these are small squares. So if you look at a big square and ask do we have a measure, well then there are quite a few squares where there are measures, but even with these five degree squares in the Eastern, Mediter in the Eastern Pacific, uh, there are just completely biologically unexplored regions. And if you use smaller squares, and a one degree square is still a very large uh, bit of, bit of uh, earth, I should, uh, Let's say it's Delaware. Uh, no, it'd be, be bigger than that. Uh, the uh, uh, nobody has looked at all. So you can see again, there are just much of the ocean is still just uh, unexplored for for life. That's looking down. Imagine taking a slice uh, through the water. So he, the top. This this is the surface of the water. This is the sea floor. And red means a lot of observations. So near shore near surface, there are a lot of observations, and people then send a box or a diver or a, uh, a submarine down to the sea floor and look. But you can see the vast midwaters here, also the dark blue, means essentially no records. So the, uh, by volume, the midwaters are the largest habitat on Earth, and most of the, the midwaters of the ocean, again, are, are 
There are just no observations. Let me talk briefly about the, uh, some of the practical benefits of the census, and then I'll say a little bit about the census and art and wrap up. Uh, Dick mentioned the uh, DNA barcodes, these short uh, DNA identifiers that can tell you whether something is an anemone or a snail or a shrimp or a sea star. These represent, these, these colored stripes represent the, uh, the uh, nucleotides of DNA, the, the base, base pairs. Uh, and each form of life will have a, a slightly different, uh, it's like a fingerprint, uh, DNA barcode. And uh, we teamed up with the, uh, the census researchers teamed up with uh, with geneticists to build a growing library of marine species for identification. And one of the wonderful things that happened was one of the first successful citizen science projects. Two high school students, seniors uh, at uh, the Trinity School in New York City, uh, decided to do a study of sushi being sold in restaurants and fish stores in New York. Uh, they it, they it, uh, helped them get into college. Uh, um, but they had a lot of fun, too. They did uh, buying and eating the sushi and then doing the, the DNA extraction and testing. And they wrote a sh small article for it uh, about for uh, an obscure magazine, Pacific Fishing Magazine. They made the front page of the New York Times, and this led to the so-called Sushi Gate scandal. Uh, it turned out that a quarter of the fish being sold in... Uh, in Manhattan was inaccurately labeled, and in every case, something inexpensive was being sold as something expensive. For example, a lot of, a lot of fish was being sold as red snapper. Some of it was actually freshwater Nile perch. Uh, you can see it's a bit different. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there were quite a few other uh, mistaken, mistakes. Uh, spotted Car Caribbean goatfish was being sold as Mediterranean mullet. Tilapia, which is again a freshwater fish, was being sold as a kind of tuna. Uh, and there have been a series of these studies now in different uh, parts of the U.S. and around the world, and everywhere in the world where it's been done, between 10 and 50 percent of the seafood has been inaccurately labeled. Uh, the FDA is now trying to use, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is now trying to use this technique to get uh, to improve the consumer protection. Uh, public engagement. Uh, the, uh, I think you can see already that there are lots of wonderful discoveries, and uh, to our delight, uh, uh, artists and all kinds of people took an interest in the census. This was one of the wonderful species uh, discovered, the uh, yeti crab, uh, 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 discovered uh, in the South Pacific, very deep water, and the yeti crab appeared on skateboards. Uh, 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 and it also, there was a stuffed animal, all kinds of things. Uh, this is another example. It's a beautiful squid, uh, jeweled squid from the uh, North Atlantic. And a fabric artist in California started making pennants, beautiful pennants. This is all made out of fabric uh, 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 with uh, sequins and painted fabric. And here you can see some sea stars on the sea floor and this beautiful jeweled squid. Um, uh, uh, artists started coming on the expeditions. This is a, a, a Norwegian uh, watercolor artist, Ornolf Opdal, and he came on uh, one of the expeditions in the, in the North Atlantic, and here you can see him working in his studio on, on the ship. This was the artist's model, and here you can see some of the, uh, the paintings. Uh, these were, have, were exhibited in uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main art, art museum then in Oslo, Norway, and elsewhere. Uh, another Norwegian artist, a sculptress, uh, Anne Edvardsen, uh, took an interest especially in some of the Holothurian sea cucumbers and some of the mollusks and did these just magnificent uh, sculptures. Uh, uh, art and science really are the same. They're both about observation. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Anne Edvardsen saw these, the, uh, these forms of sea life as, uh, as well as uh, we do looking through microscopes. Uh, the census had the wonderful uh, uh, fortune also to team with a French-led uh, project to make a documentary about ocean life, uh, a film called Oceans, uh, led by the great director Jacques Perrin. Some of you may have seen a film called Winged Migration about the long-distance migration of birds, uh, or a film called Microcosmos about insects. Uh, uh, we worked with him on the film Oceans. 
Uh, a version was released in the U.S. by uh, Disney, which uh, I would say is not as good as the, uh, the version seen in the rest of the world, which is more of a, a, a Disney made it for a younger audience. Uh, if time permits, at the very end, I'll, I'll try to show you maybe just three minutes from that. Uh, of course, we produced uh, books. Uh, almost everything is available open access uh, online. Uh, we produced a report that's available in many languages, a final report. Again, I mentioned open access. A lot of, we worked a lot with Public Library of Science where there are collections of the papers. So almost everything I've described to you is available easily and freely online. Uh, we teamed up with the National Geographic Society here in Washington, D.C., which has some of the world's best cartographers to make a two-sided wall map, uh, uh, which was extensively distributed and is also available online in a zoomable form. Uh, that uh, This was an incredible discipline, I think, for the, the researchers in the program, too, to try to decide you know, what information would actually go into this. The last thing I want to say is that, uh, of course, the experience. Uh, at the outset, I mentioned Frank Press and Bob White and cooperative international science projects. And it's one of the great joys of working in science. It's a better world in many ways. Uh, here you see the team uh, that worked on the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf at a meeting at Sultan Qaboos University in Muscat. Uh, we had very good participation by uh, Iranian scientists. Here's the, uh, the, the Caribbean team, which was led by a wonderful uh, expert on Queen Conks from uh, uh, Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, the uh, Southern Africa team, the Indian Ocean team, the Komal uh, Datsian, uh, China. Uh, here, this was a meeting that all of us had uh, on the Queen Mary in Long Beach. Uh, and uh, marine biology hadn't had a tradition of big science, uh, you know, compared to uh, astronomy or physics or some other fields. And uh, I think one of everybody, I think, had a very happy experience that we can work together successfully. Uh, Dick mentioned that the, the gratifying award the, in 2011, uh, the Japan uh, awarded a uh, major, major prize, the International Cosmos Prize, uh, to the census. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, award of uh, more than half a million dollars. This is the grand summary. First, it can be done at the beginning. And speaking with Jim Baker, that this was part of the question. Could, could it actually be done? Uh, 2,700 scientists, more than 80 countries, 540 field expeditions. Total expenditure globally, we estimate, including all the ship time, about $650 million over the 11 years. 1,200 new species disco disco discovered and described, about 5,000 more awaiting description. 130,000 species with web pages, 35,000 species with genetic identification. Thousands of publications. Uh, as I said at the beginning, finally, marine life is richer, more connected, more altered, and yet less known and less explored. We did end with a poll <laughs> to see the most popular animal. And uh, the winner was this blobfish. <laughs> so no, it's, it's a beautiful animal. Uh, and uh, so. Mr. Blobby, as uh, he came to be called, was uh, voted the most popular animal in the, in the census. And on that note, Dick, I'll close.